Hi there. Continuing my journey of reading all my old notebooks. Tonight I'm reading my notebook from a seventh grade. This was for a language arts class and every day we had a different writing task. So here we go. I dislike homework because it takes too much time to do it. I also dislike homework because there is no point to it. We go over the stuff in class, why make us do more of it at home? I don't get it. I could be doing something better instead of schoolwork at home. That's why I don't like homework. Direct object versus indirect object. November, or psh, September 5th. For Christmas, I received many gifts. My dad got me a calendar. My mom gave me some movies. My grandparents gave all of us some money. Last but not least, I got a, I got a CD player. Exciting. In front of me is a huge dark door that has scratches on the surface. It has a small doorknob above one of the bigger scratches. I see that there are no hinges hanging on to the door. The door is made out of sticks that are tied together with ropes. He's walking over a rope bridge. It's tall. It's heavy. It won't open. Looking for a key. He opened it. Uh, okay. Showing a person. Describing a person by showing them. My friend Philip is very tall. He has hair that hangs down to his ears. He has tan colored skin and has gaps in between his teeth. His arms hang down below his hips. Every once in a while, his eye tears up and he has to wipe his sleep on it. Wipe his sleeve on it. A long time ago, the pilgrims traveled by sea from Britain to America. They came with three ships. When they arrived, they set up camps and met the Indians. The pilgrims befriended the Indians and the Indians taught them new things. My favorite place. My favorite place is made out of white leather. It is in a big room with white carpet. It is long and makes me feel at home. It has a big screen TV sitting diagonal from it in the same room. Can you guess where my favorite place is? That was our living room couch. A sacred bundle of things. My small bundle of things holds things that I like to do and things that people have given to me. One of the things in my bundle is a book. The other is a journal. Last of all is a globe given to me by my mom. The book represents that I like to read. It is written by Lemony Snicket. He's one of my favorite authors. I like reading his books because he's mysterious. That is why I like to read. That is why I brought in that book. The journal represents that I like to draw and write. I enjoy writing what I feel. I draw things that come into my head. I need to draw that thing when it comes into my head. The globe represents that I like social studies. The rocks that are in the globe represent that I like science and rocks. That's why I like the globe. Voice. When me and my butler, Dubert, were walking in the park, I heard a smush. I lifted my $500 shoes and saw some poo. I started yelling at Dubert and scoped the park. I saw a young lady walking her dog. I ordered Dubert to arrest the lady and have the dog beheaded. Okay. When and where? A few years ago, my grandparents, my mom, and I were driving back from Georgia to Indiana. We were driving in the complete countryside of Southern Indiana. We were riding in my grandparents' van, sitting on the leather seats. I was wrapped up in my blanket, taking a nap. My grandparents were in the front and my mom was sitting in the seat next to me. And then, boom, there was a huge crack of thunder. I jumped up from my seat, clen clenching on my stomach. I looked out the window and saw clouds forming above. Huge flashes of lightning were touching the ground a few miles ahead. 
It began pouring down rain in sheets. My grandparents turned on the radio. It said that there were some tornadoes a few miles away from us. I hopped under my blanket and prayed over and over again. I thought I could hear a tornado coming. I kept praying. I looked out the window again and saw the clouds moving rapidly in circles. I was very scared. I went under my blanket again and prayed some more. I shut my eyes for five minutes, it seemed like. When I opened my eyes, I looked out from my blanket and glanced out the window. I saw that the rain was clearing up. The lightning and thunder died down also. A big grin came upon my face and I prayed again, thanking God for protecting me. I learned that day that God is always watching me and that makes me feel safe. Many horrible things happen at shopping malls. These things are usually caused by teenagers who are not supervised by their parents. <laughs> Teens can sometimes go crazy when they aren't supervised. Acting like this can lead to bad situations. They will have to pay the consequences if they act up. Seventh grade me going on a rant. Um, okay. I don't want to read this one. This is an exercise. Okay, here's the first short story. Um, this was written after the movie Poseidon came out, which for some reason I was very obsessed with the movie of Poseidon. But this writing workshop is called The Poseidon Adventure. As the guests aboard Poseidon prepared for the new year, if it was lighting a fire in their suite and enjoying a cup of hot chocolate, or if it was attending the party held in the cruise ship's ballroom, Mother Nature was rapidly plummeting towards them. Jeff ran along the track on the upper deck. He was dressed in long gym clothes with a towel wrapped around his neck. No one was really at the pool section today because the temperature was in the low 50s and there was a light breeze. It was early, so the bars were setting up chairs and tables preparing for another busy workday. They finished washing the cups and setting up the nozzles. Jeff stopped at the main pool section. He rested himself on one of the glass gates looking out into the horizon. He gazed at the beautiful sunrise and said to himself, it's going to be a good day. Then he continued jogging. Madison Walker was gently pushing her eight-year-old son Ryan on his arm so he would wake. He opened his eyes and greeted her with a smile. Good morning, mom, he said. Time to buy you a suit for tonight, sweetie. Get dressed, Madison told Ryan. He sat on the side of his bed and yawned. Emily Rawson and her boyfriend, Kenny, were sitting in her enormous suite on the white sofas, holding each other's hands. When are you going to tell him, Emily? Kenny asked. Hmm, today, she replied. When today, he asked. Please, Kenny, I'll tell him. Just then, Emily's father, Raymond, walked in, holding two empty goblets in his hand. Hey, kids, how are you doing? He asked them. We're good, Kenny replied. Ken, I distinctly remember your suite being down the hall, Ray told them. Dad, we are just talking. Kenny got lonely, Emily told her father. Emily, I'm just saying that I don't feel comfortable with the two of you in here by yourselves at your age. Dad! I'm over how you lecture us like this. Just because you are mayor doesn't mean that you have control over me. I'm 22 now, she yelled. She stood up and ran to her room and slammed the door. Kenny turned around and exited out of the suite. Layla Watkins was entering through the mayor room. The long room that was sort of like a hallway was crowded with the entire crew of the ship. She stumbled up the staircase toward the lobby. She gazed at the enormous lobby. Music was playing through the speakers. The sun rays peered through the glass ceiling. The glass elevators were full of people. People sat on the couches around coffee tables, enjoying refreshments. Layla walked towards the main staircase. Just then, Jeff ran into her. Sorry, ma'am, Jeff said, turning towards the staircase. Um, I'm looking for the galley, Layla told Jeff. 
I believe it's off limits to guests. Jeff stopped and looked at her. Not so much for a rooms person. I work here, she said, even though she did not work there. Oh, it's just down that hall and make a left, Jeff replied. Thanks, Layla turned around and headed for the hall. Jeff ran up the staircase. In the galley, all the chefs were getting ready for the night. Layla searched for Austin. Austin ran toward her and grabbed her arm. Layla, you were supposed to stay inside, he lectured. I know, but that room is so stuffy, she said. I could lose my job for sneaking you on this boat. You asked me if you could come aboard and I let you. So promise me you will stay inside. He stared at her with a serious face. Okay, she agreed. Then Austin kissed her on the cheek. Chapter 2 It was near midnight. The captain was giving his New Year's speech on the stage of the ballroom. Everyone was seated at the tables waiting for their dinner. Some people were enjoying or not enjoying a game of poker or blackjack on the balconies of the ballroom. They were all ready for the new year, but they were not prepared for what was coming their way. Poseidon, he was the god of the sea, the captain recited. He built his home on the bottom of the sea. In nearly an hour, we will celebrate the new year. What better way to celebrate than on the greatest ship ever? May you have clear sailings for all your years to come. Everyone cheered as the captain finished his speech and exited the stage. Then Fiona, the ship's performer, entered the stage and began to sing. The band began to play along for her. The band began to play along to her song. Raymond was playing a game of poker. One of his opponents was Jeff. He was enjoying a cigarette while staring at the enormous pot sitting in the middle of the poker table. Then he looked at his cards and doubted himself. Sitting next to Jeff was a man named Lois. He was wearing a corny tuxedo and he had a short little mustache just over his upper lip. Lucky Lewis never loses a game, Lewis said to himself. Then he looked at his cards and gave out a sigh of depression. I fold. Raymond picked up his glass full of champagne and poured it into his mouth. Then, em then Emily walked over to him. She was with Kenny. Hey, Dad, we're going to head over to the disco, she whispered in his ear. All right, he replied. Ryan Walker was playing his PSP. He was dodging people as he walked, but most of his focus was on the game. Jeff was counting the poker chips in his hand when he ran into Ryan. The poker chips scattered over the floor and the PSP fell toward Jeff. Jeff picked it up and Ryan picked up the poker chips. They switched the contents and then Madison came over to Ryan. What happened here, she asked. I wasn't watching where I was going, Ryan recited. The captain wants to talk with you, Ryan. All right, Mom, I'll be back before the countdown. Jeff stood up. Him and Madison talked for a while. At the disco, Emily and Kenny were dancing closely. The lights were flashing and the disc jockey moved to the music. Layla walked in and grabbed a New Year's hat. A few minutes later, Fiona stood on the stage. She began the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year. Everyone cheered as balloons and crepe paper fell from the nets on the ceilings. They cheered for joy and took sips from their goblets, but on the captain's bridge, something else was happening. One of the co-captains came in singing Auld Lang Syne and was wearing a New Year's hat. Quiet, quiet, the main co-captain shouted at him. The whole bridge became quiet. Something's wrong, he said. Chapter three, which is underlined in a bunch of colors for some reason. The guests were cheering. The captains on the bridge are confused. The main co-captain grabs his binoculars. He looks over the right side of the boat. Something was going terribly wrong. No, no, the captain shouted. He looked out the window again. The moon was disappearing rapidly. We need to turn, we need to turn. He ran to the controller. He pushed it to the right. Come on. Come on, turn. He stared at the, comp at the compass. 
Sound the alarm. One of the co-captains pulled the trigger of the alarm. In the ballroom, they were all singing Auld Lang Syne when the alarm sounded. Attention, attention. Please report to your emergency stations immediately. This is not a drill, the alarm shouted. Everyone paused to listen. The captain and Fiona stared at each other. <sighs> Ugh! Ah! Everyone screamed. They ran around trying to get to the exit. The staircases were full of frightened people. They were climbing over each other to get to the emergency stations. Over to the right side of the ship, the moon had disappeared by now. It was blocked by a hundred foot rogue wave. The wave was plummeting towards the ship at tremendous speeds. Madison ran toward the state, the stage where Ryan was. There were still a lot of people in the ballroom. The staircases were blocked now. She approached Ryan. He stood there crying his eyes out. The wave was a few yards away from the right side of the boat. Dot, 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 dot. Just then, dot, 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 dot. It hit. Millions of gallons of water collided into the side of the ship. It ripped off the sweet balconies, staircases on the walkways, crashed them th through the windows, sending gallons of water into the suites and hallways. The side window in the captain's bridge exploded and water threw the co-captains into the wall. The computers exploded, sending electrical volts into the bodies of the captains. The ship began to tip to the side. Everything in the ship fell to the left. Tables, televisions, cupboards, chairs, and the passengers tumbled into the walls. In the ballroom, Madison just about grabbed Ryan's hand when she slipped. He grabbed the leg of the piano, which was sealed to the stage. She fell to the wall along with everyone else. Now Poseidon was on its side. The pools were empty and the water had fallen into the ocean. The wave was still colliding into the ship and it was taking over the whole thing. The or Poseidon continued to fall to the side and the upper decks were disappearing into the ocean. Chairs and tables were falling into the passengers' skulls and spines. <laughs> Glass was exploding into their faces. They fell from the bottom of the balconies onto the chandeliers. Poseidon was now completely upside down. Chapter 4 Once a marvelous ship sailing triumphantly across the ocean, now a half-sunken vessel lying upside down in the middle of nowhere. The lights flickered on, releasing light and screams into the ballroom. With some of the wires and cords ripped apart and very dangerous, the electricity coming back on sent sparks and bolts of electricity through the room. People close to the wire wires were being electrocuted. Madison lifted her head and stood up. She looked around. There was no sign of Ryan. She began to shout his name. She looked to her side. There was a woman hurled on the chandelier. <laughs> Glass from the chandelier was sticking through her arms and legs, and blood all over her. Madison began to freak out because the lady died with her eyes open and was staring directly at her. Madison started to shout for Ryan again. Then Raymond dug himself out of the pile of dead people on top of him. <laughs> he looked around and then stood up. He noticed Madison shouting for Ryan. He helped her look for him. He looked up. Ryan was lying on the piano, which was still sealed to the stage. Steep, wow. Which was still sealed to the stage. And that is where my scene by scene summary of the movie Poseidon ends. I don't know why I chose that for my writing workshop. Um, but now we're going to dive into Austin and Alexis part two, Black Hole. Main parts not in order. Proposal answer at beginning. Lots of star brights disappearing, dying for no apparent reason. Alexis is transported to a protective area so she isn't harmed. Nobody shall know they are engaged. 
Austin is sent to find the source of missing star brights. The black hole is a poison swooping across the islands. Only has effect on star brights. Some die and some get hypnotized. The source of the poison is the star bright clock tower. Inside the clock tower is a fungus-like weed that's black and lets out poison. Near the end, the fungus, or the black hole, turns into a monster-like thing. It leaves the clock tower and searches for Austin on all the islands. Black Hole hypnotizes Starbrights to find Austin and bring him to Black Hole. Austin is visiting Alexis on the protective island because the poison stopped for a while. The only way he knows to go back to Starshine Islands is if the president of the islands contacts him. Evil Starbrights force president to contact Austin, telling him that everything is fine, but he needs to check up on a few things. A trap. The plan was that Austin's boat arrived near the islands, they would blow it up, and he would die. Austin receives the message from the president and goes to the port where his yacht was. His captain heads out for Starshine Islands. On the way to the islands, he hears Tanya's voice from the heavens. She warns him about Black Hole and the trap. He doesn't tell his captain, for he fears that he will drive to a different port. When they arrive near the port, Austin jumps out of the back of the boat. The captain keeps driving and sees the missile rushing toward the yacht. He turns quickly to the right, but the missile was locked on the target and blew up the boat. The black hole thought he won. Austin swam to the cave where White Dwarf used to live. This is book two. I haven't read, I haven't read book one yet. That's going to be next week, but this was me describing what happens in the second book. Um, here is another writing workshop. There was no sound in the town of Plainsville that night. Early that morning, the town's nuclear power plant witnessed a malfunction and sent Plainsville into the darkness. It was so sudden that nobody even got a chance to scream. In one second, the town was gone. July 4th, three days before the explosion. Of course I will marry you. This is wonderful. I'm so excited, Lucy said to her new friend, her new fiancé, Josh. They were sitting before the lake watching the Independence Day fireworks display. Behind them, the trees swayed with the wind. Lucy leaned her face toward Josh's and their lips met, bringing them the first kiss of their engagement. How romantic. Um, and that was that for that story. That was brief. Here's another writing workshop, and this one is similar to um, the premise of Clue, where a bunch of people are invited to a dinner party. Um, but it's different. Everyone arrived around 8 p.m. as expected. The gentlemen hung their coats on the coat rack and straightened their ties. The ladies handed their coats to the butler and glanced into the mirror to see whether or not their hair needed fixing. After their entrance, they all proceeded into the dining room where they awaited for the arrival of their hosts. Miss Elena Evenu wore a long white evening gown with light blue sleeves. Mr. Manuel Perry wore his mustard-colored suit. His white hair was bushed up under his brown hat and his monocle stretched from the pocket of his suit coat to his right eye. Mrs. Angela Wright wore a pink evening gown that stretched across the floor, six inches away from her high-heeled shoes. White gloves covered almost all of her arms. Senor Paquito Trevino wore his Mexican-style tuxedo. Miss Susie Everhart wore the long black dress she wore to her husband's funeral ten years earlier. Mr. Craig Wenberg wasn't a very formal man, so he wore his coat that he wore to work every Saturday. Como se llama, senor? Senor Paquito asked Mr. Manuel Perry, who sat in the chair to his left. Pardon? Manuel replied. Como se llama? Paquito repeated. Excuse me, but I do not understand what you are asking. Como se llama? Nombre? He means, what is your name? 
Mr. Craig Wenberg told him. Oh, sorry. He turned and looked at Paquito. He stuck out his right hand. Mr. Manuel Perry, nice to meet you. What's your name? Mi nombre? Paquito asked. Yes, uh, Mr. Perry replied. Se llama Paquito Trevino. Dinner is served. The chef came through the kitchen doors. He went back through the doors and came back with a tray full of plates. For our appetizer, we have a very divine French soup from, well, you know, France. Do you think it's polite to eat when our hosts have not yet arrived? Miss Angela Wright asked. She didn't care much about soup. They're the ones who invited us here, then did not show up. We should not think twice about eating without them, Miss Elena replied with her very heavy French accent. What I hear is that they got stuck in the nasty weather, Craig replied to Elena's comment. There was a loud crack of thunder. Speak of the devil. The chef finished handing out the soup. I will be back when you finish your soup, he walked into the kitchen. Angela stared at her soup. She looked away from the table at the decorations around the room. Mouse! Donde? Paquito shouted. Over by the vase, she replied frantically. Where? Elena asked again. I don't see it. Manuel stood up. Donde es raton? Craig stood up and walked over to the vase. He lifted his foot and brought it down on the mouse. He lifted his foot again and there was a loud squeak. It's only a chew toy for a cat. <laughs> He turned around and went back to his seat. I am truly sorry. I've been a bit jumpy around rodents ever since my husband died of rabies. Angela apologized. <laughs> she continued staring at her soup. So, Paquito, do you speak any English? Manuel asked. Ingles? No, I, I speak a, a very weak English. Excuse my accent, Paquito replied. Why don't we go around the table and introduce ourselves, Craig asked. That sounds like a good idea, Angela replied. Why don't we start with you, Paquito, Craig implied. Me don't see why not, wow, okay. Me trying to write for Paquito. Paquito stood up. Me llamo es Paquito. Me just come here from Mexico. Do you have, do you have a green card, Alina interrupted. Paquito stared at her. Como? Green card. The card you need to come to America. It's green. <laughs> oh, green card. See, si, see, si, me have a green card. Paquito said nervously. You may continue. I apologize for the interruption. Alina apologized. Gracias. Me used to have a familia. They died in a bad fire. No problemo. I am happy the way I am. Gracias. He sat down and continued slurping down his soup. Manuel, Craig implied, do you wish to go next? Manuel stood up. Good evening. My name is Manuel Perry. I live in New York City, New York. I once had a wife, Sandra. She was hit by a trolley while walking across the busy city streets. It was many years ago. That is my story. He sat back down. Craig stood up. My name is Craig Wenberg. I live in South Bend, Indiana. I have never been married. My family... What? My family was brutal... <laughs> wow. My family was brutally shot in our basement when I was away at summer camp. <laughs> what? <laughs> he sat down. <laughs> Susie Everhart stood up. Death. Death is like rain. She sat back down. Excuse me? What did you say? Craig asked. I said, death is like rain, she replied. What does that mean? I don't know. I just made it up. I have no story to tell you, nor will I ever. Well then, let's continue. Elena? Elena stood up. I am from France. My parents were killed by the German Nazis. Darn those Nazis, Manuel interrupted. That is all I have to say, Alina finished. Angela stood up. My name is Angela Wright. As you all know, my husband died of rabies. 
I do not like to talk about my past, so I won't. We all have secrets, some of us more than others. She sat back down. A car's headlights appeared outside. Who could Zep be? And Lena asked aloud. It could be our hosts, Craig remarked. He stood up and walked to the window. It seems to be a stretch. What seems to be a stretch? Angela asked. The car. The car is a stretch limo. He went over to the other window. Someone is getting out. What do you, What do they look like? Emmanuel asked. There seems to be a man and a woman exiting the limo. The woman is a light brunette. She is dressed in a fancy light blue gown. Her shoulders and chest are covered by a large white boa. She has expensive diamonds around her neck. They must be rich, Craig described. Well, of course they are rich. Look at this house, you fool, Elena observed. What does the man look like? Handsome, I suppose? Angel asked. I can't see his face yet. He's on the other side of the limo, just outside the light. Is he handsome? Angela asked again. I can't see him yet. Patience. Craig looked back at her. He waited a moment for the figure of the man to move into the light. To be continued four pages ahead. So brief interruption of that riveting story. This is a blues song. It gets in my head, that country song beat. Stays in there all day till next time I eat. Toby Keith sings along with his funky cowboy hat. And every time I hear him, I want to hit him with a bat. <laughs> country music plays all day. Country music plays all day. When will it ever stop? <laughs> that was my opinion of country music in seventh grade. Just walking along with my new pair of shoes, then I stepped in some mud and then in some crud. I walked to the store to return the shoes. The clerk said, no refund, and I was stunned. No refunds, no refunds. You have to keep it forever. Uh, dream list. Become an architect. Star in a movie, a small role or lead role. Go to Paris. Have children, get married, go to New York, become a grandparent, go to Panama, see the Taj Mahal, and direct a movie. Not in that particular order. If all of my dreams come true, I will live in a house I designed myself. I will have a family and memories of all the places I've seen. I will cherish the moment I became a grandparent and tell my grandchildren of the time I was in a movie, directed one, going to all the places. If all my dreams didn't come true, I would be living alone in an apartment. <laughs> I would just think about being all the things I wanted to be. I would dream still about going to the places. I would not work, probably, maybe at a small business. That is what would happen. So, continuation of the story from a few pages ago. Can you see him yet? Angela asked repeatedly. Not yet, just wait. I can't control how fast he moves, Craig shouted. Why does it interest you so much on knowing what the man looks like? Manuel asked Angela. It, it's just I've been single for the past few years, and I'd rather sit at a table with a handsome man than a man with such filth as Chico over here. Pfft, that's mean. She pointed over to Paquito. Paquito, me amo Paquito. Paquito sneered at Angela. Excuse me, Angela replied and looked away. Craig looked through the window once more and watched as the figure of the man on the other side of the very expensive automobile gave the chauffeur who stood at the driver's door a very large tip. Then the man walked into the light that the lantern on the outside wall of the house provided. I can see him now, Craig shouted with glee, so Angela could finally stop asking him. Angela began, what does he, Craig, he is very tall. He is wearing a very expensive black tuxedo. Oh, he sounds dreamy, Angela remarked. May I continue, Craig asked. Yes, sorry, Angela replied. Craig looked out the window. He has a top hat and, or he has a top hat on and has a very expensive cane. It seems to be made of granite. 
and has a large diamond at the top for his hand. Oh, he sounds rich, Angela said. Oh, and he has a seemingly large mustache right above his upper lip. Oh, I love mustaches. They're so handsome. Those are all the physical features I can see from this angle. Perhaps we will discover more when he actually joins us for dinner. All of them sat and waited for their hosts to finally arrive. They all heard footsteps right outside the dining room door. Oh my god, there's someone in here, Angela shouted. It is but only the butler, Manuel replied. How are you so sure, Angela asked. Because after Craig gave the description of our hosts, the butler who was standing in here with us left the room, and that's when the footsteps began. Out in the hallway. Oh. The front door opened, and the sound of voices filled the hallway outside the dining room. The voices were those of two men and a woman giving their greetings to each other. Most likely, they were the voices of the two hosts and the butler. If they are the hosts, then why didn't they knock on the door or ring the bell? Angela asks. Because it is their house. They don't need to knock. Craig replied to Angela's idiotic question. Oh, well, wow, they have a great taste for lovely decorations. There were more footsteps that approached the dining room door. Then the door opened and in walked the butler who stood in there earlier. Good evening. Please welcome your hosts, the very rich and French Gustave and Agnes Fonghair. <laughs> the butler announced. The man and woman that were outside exiting from the limo walked in together. Fonghair? What kind of name is that? Angela asked. It is French, the woman who just entered and Elena replied at the same time. Has anyone told you that you are a chatterbox? Craig asked Angela. No, she replied. Well, Craig began with a sigh. Welcome to our home. You have all been invited to share a lovely feast with us where we can all talk about politics, money, and taxes, Mrs. Songhair announced. That is the last thing I need right now, Craig said. He was very annoyed by politics. It is but only a joke, Agnes Fonghair replied. Well, then excuse my remark, Craig responded. The two hosts walked to separate ends of the table and sat down. The chef came through the kitchen doors with two more bowls of soup and placed them before Mr. and Mrs. Fonghair. I'm so sorry that we've arrived so very late, Agnes apologized. It was only five minutes, Manuel replied. Angela sat at the end of the table that Gustav Fonghair sat at. She stared at him for a very long time, then finally introduced herself. I'm Angela Wright. I think you are very handsome. Excuse me, Ag Agnes exclaimed. Oh, it's all right, Agnes. I hear it almost every day while I'm walking the streets of New York. Oh going to be continued in a minute. Uh. Oh, okay. Continued. I'm quite used to it by now, Gustav remarked. You hear it every day? Agnes asked. Yes. You have never told me that. Don't be jealous, dear. It is only lonely girls who say it. I would never leave you for them. Oh, all right. I apologize for the small fight, everyone. Those things happen quite a bit once you get older and still sleep with the same person. <laughs> Agnes apologized. She finished her soup and pushed it away from the edges of the table. Gustav slurped, slurped the last of his soup out of the spoon and placed it on the bowl. He then pushed the bowl away from the edge of the table. Out of nowhere, Angela dropped her spoon on the floor and announced, Oops, I have dropped my spoon. I'll get it for you, miss. Gustav leaned over to get her spoon. No, I can get it myself, Angela shouted. Gustav sat back in his chair. All right. Angela leaned over the side of her chair and grabbed the spoon. She began to lift herself back to the chair, then placed her hand upon Gustav's right knee. Excuse me, Gustav said loudly. What is it? Angela asked. 
may you please remove your hand, please? Oh yes, I'm sorry. And where was her hand placed exactly? Agnes asked Gustav as she stared at Angela with an angry look. Only above his knee, Angela replied. You aren't the same as those lonely women in New York that make that comment. Wow, hold on. You aren't the same as those lonely women in New York that make comments to my husband. You're worse than all of them. Now, Agnes, don't be too harsh on her. She probably just needed to place her hand on something to push herself back into the chair, Gustav replied. Fine, but if anything else happens with you and that girl, I swear, I'll... Nothing will happen, Agnes, Gustav said. What is taking the chef so long in there? Craig asked. I'll go see, Gustav stood up. Chapter 2, The First Killing Gustav walked toward the kitchen door. He walked through into the kitchen. He looked around for the chef, but the only odd thing he saw was that the window on the far wall was broken. There was no sign of the cook. Gustav looked in the pantry and the freezer and out the back door. He began to walk back to the kitchen doors when he heard the back door open slightly. He looked behind him and there was a man dressed completely in black holding a butcher's knife. The man closed the door behind him and locked it. The man walked toward Gustav and swung the knife. The blade pierced the flesh of Gustav's arm and he fell to the ceramic tile. Gustav stared at the man's face as the arms of the man lifted into the air and then were brought back down, throwing the knife into Gustav's chest. He died instantly. After five minutes of waiting for Gustav, Agnes stood up and walked into the kitchen. There was a loud scream. Everyone stood up and walked into the kitchen. Agnes stood by Gustav's dead body and cried as she watched his blood seep out of, his, out of the gouge the knife made. What has happened? Agnes shouted in horror. He's dead, Angela shouted. Maybe he's just wounded, Craig implied. He got down on the floor and checked for a pulse in Gustav's neck. Why couldn't we hear anything? Angela asked. Gustav was never a man to scream when in dangerous situations. If it was a person threatening him, he would try to negotiate, Agnes answered. He's dead, Craig announced quietly. No! Agnes cried, falling to the floor. She lay beside Gustav, trying to force life back into him. No, 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 why, 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 why did this happen? Angela stared at the dead body of the rich man and began to weep heavily. She weeped with sadness, for she had fallen deeply in love with the man. Also, she cried with joy, for if she wasn't able to be married to the man, nobody should have. It was one of you, wasn't it? Agnes shouted. She sat up on her bottom and slowly moved her head across the line of people in the room, examining each of their faces. But how could it have been one of us? Alina asked. We were with you in the dining room the whole time. He was in the kitchen. I guess you're right, but who could have done this? Agnes cried. We don't know. All we know right now is that the person who did kill him used a butcher's knife, Craig said. How do we know that? Nenu asked. Well, there's a butcher's knife lodged right into the chest of the victim, Craig said, realizing that Manuel was a little slow. <laughs> oh, Manuel responded. Maybe the cook did it, Angela shouted. You're right. Agnes quickly stood up and ran to the back door, not realizing that it was locked. She tried to turn the handle and then said, but it's locked. He couldn't have locked it from the outside after he's escaped. A heavy wind blew into the room from the kitchen window, or from the broken window. The window, it is broken, Alina shouted. Craig ran to the window and stared into the black pits of the night sky. I think I can see the far wing of the house. That's where the bedrooms are, Agnes announced. Are there any outside lights on that wing of the house? Craig asked. Yes, there are. I'll go switch them on. Agnes ran out the door, which led to the front hallway. She ran to the entrance of the rear wing of the mansion. She flipped the switch to the outside lights on, then ran back to the kitchen. Back in the kitchen. Now I can see the whole outside wall of the wing, Craig shouted. What do you see, Agnes said, as she walked back into the room. One of the top windows is open. He waited a little while until he saw an object coming out of the window. There's a man. There's a man coming out of the window. 
And I think that's the end of that story. Which was pretty terrible. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, then this is just a random writing workshop. Then the music stopped and there was an uneasy feeling that crept up each and every one's spine. They all stopped talking and glanced around the majestic ballroom. Up above the ceiling where the wires were, the wires for each and every light was connected, there was a noise that sounded of glass breaking. Everyone was creeped. The bulbs placed inside the light fixtures began to give off a shrill whistling sound. Then the fixture atop the grand staircase's left banister shuddered profusely and the shattered and then shattered, sending petite pieces of glass through the room. There were sudden and short shrieks that erupted from the women who were standing next to the staircase. Following the explosion of that single light fixture came several more. First, the fifth light that hung above the stage where the musicians sat in confusion. Second, some of the lamps hanging on the wall shattered. Bulbs began to explode more rapidly until the guests could not jump every time <laughs> them exploded. Less than a minute later, all of them had shattered, all except for the massive chandelier that hung over the middle of the dance floor. There was a loud noise which sounded like fingertips scraping across the chalkboard. The noise stopped and was followed by what sounded like a box of books falling upon the floor. The gleams of light that come from the bulbs of the chandelier tweaked and the entire mass of metal and diamond shifted away from the ceiling. The wires which held the chandelier were cut and it plummeted downward toward the ballroom dance floor. The end. <laughs> All right, the story of Odorous and the Smelly Plant. Odorous was born and lived at the rocky base of Mount Olympus. His home always would smell of flowers and many other things that smelled nice. This was because his wife was Aroma, the goddess of, well, Aroma. One day, Odorous was tricked by one of the titans to capture Cupid, Aphrodite's messenger. Odorous, being the fool that he was, agreed to capture Cupid. The next day, Odorous snuck up the side of Mount Olympus. He heard a noise and then saw a small chubby child fly through the clouds, wings attached to his back and a bow in his hands. Perfect, Odorous rejoiced in his head. He snuck up to the flying child and jumped, trying to snatch him in his hands. Cupid let out a wail and immediately flew to Aphrodite's part of Mount Olympus. Cupid reported Odorous's behavior to Aphrodite. Wow. Aphrodite, shocked by what she was hearing, ordered Odorous to be brought to her. Odorous stood before Aphrodite and listened to her complaints. Aphrodite then cursed Odorous and made him fall in love with the smelly plant placed in the Lernian swamp. Odorous, now obsessed with the smelly plant, fled to the Lernian swamp. He followed his urge for love to the location of the plant. The horrendous smell of the plant flew past Odorous's nostrils because he couldn't smell it anymore. However, the odor of the plant seeped into Odorous's sweat glands and stuck there permanently. Odorous, not wanting to live at the swamp, grabbed the smelly plant and fled back to Mount Olympus. All of the running Odorous did forced his sweat glands to release pools of sweat along with the horrific stench of the smelly plant. Zeus, the king of Mount Olympus and the god of the sky, immediately smelled Odorous's odor and gagged in disgust. Zeus ordered for Odorous to be locked away in a smell-proof tower, but that didn't work. The odor of Odo 
The odor of Odorous's sweat seeped through the walls of the tower and wafted through the town. The smell crept into everyone's home and somehow got into their sweat glands. The next day when the sun made the made two entire what okay. The next day when the sun made the entire town scorching hot, everyone began to sweat, and the odor hung over the town like a smelly cloud. Zeus, not being able to do anything about the smell, simply sat on his throne and threw a temper tantrum. Oh, the end. <laughs> that is the picture of Mount Olympus. And something at the bottom. That is a very tall building. Here is a poem called, If I Was Homeless. If I was homeless, I would live on the street. There wouldn't be any showers, so I would probably reek. People would probably stare as I beg them for money. Some days would be rainy, some days would be sunny. The end. Okay. In about ten years, I'll be writing books. They'll all be accepted. There will be no tears. I'll write so many books, I'll need my own library. A library so big, it'll need its own cooks. I'll be living in a mansion all by myself. If there ain't enough rooms, I'll get an expansion. Sooner or later, I'll get a wife to have by my side. Even if anything goes wrong, we'll be together for life. We'll travel, we'll travel together whenever we want. We'll be happy every day, no matter the weather. I'll be so rich, as rich as Bill Gates. I'll be so rich, I won't even need to try. This one is called A Walk With Nature. I took a walk in the woods just because I could. I walked up and down, feeling the bark on the wood. The trees were brown, the leaves on top just like a crown. The spider webs formed a net, the flowers looked like clowns. I looked for all that I could get, the plants were all set, to show off their wonder. Even though they were somewhat wet. Then came the thunder, letting out a great blunder. I gave a little shudder and then began to wander. To wander. When I was two and my sister was four, we dropped our diapers onto the floor. We ran outside onto the street. We began to run around, showing off our bare seat. When people would walk out to do their morning work, their eyes were bigger than baseballs, and they did not give us their usual smirk. But when we came up to them and said, I want a smooch around, <laughs> that one's dumb and uninspired. Here is a letter to myself from seventh grade. Hi, Jordan. Right now, I'm in seventh grade. I am sitting in language arts writing this letter. My personality traits are intelligent, modest, shy, and tired. My physical traits are blonde hair, jean shorts, brown shirt, cool watch, pale skin, very pale, and blue eyes. Oh, and thick eyebrows. My interests are writing, drawing, etc. An experience from seventh grade that illustrates my character is the fact that I have already written four books and sent the first book to a publisher. By the way, have all of those been published yet? An experience from seventh grade that illustrates my weakness of character is the fact that I hang out with the wrong friends and some of their trash talk and that kind of stuff is rubbing off on me. I really miss my friends from Indiana. You still talk to Philip, right? My best memory is when I finished my first book. My worst memory is when our church did box land and I was sick for four days. Remember that? The ways I want to improve are dumping my current friends and finding ones that are Christians like me. 
I also want to grow a little taller. Have fun graduating. <laughs> Jordan Summer, 7th grade, May 21st, 2007. P.S. You're still going out with Anna, right? Oh my goodness. That might be the end of this notebook. I think it is. The rest are just blank pages. So that was my notebook from seventh grade for language arts with a lot of writing workshops. At that time, I was writing a book series and finished four out of the six books. So my next few live sessions are going to be reading those books, starting with um, Austin and Alexis part one. And I will read that next Saturday at seven. So thanks for joining me and reading my seventh grade books. What is this? Okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs>